Welcome to the chaos. Oh, we just, oh man. It's Zeke, I don't even think we need you doing the six anymore. We're just gonna hit it from each side. That's how we doing it. That's how we doing it. What up everybody and welcome back to the chaos. This is my host, Danny J. Gomez. I'm switching up. This is my host, Danny J. Gomez. Michael Tableman on Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that works. I like to meet me on Friday. Michael Tableman, the creator, the amazing guy behind this awesome Aww. podcast. Wouldn't be here without you. I wanted to tell you that I was thinking about that last night, man. You make all this go, and we're just here for the show. Love you, brother. I love you. But after we're that here. body moment, <laughs> another person I love very, very dearly. On the show today, we have Lindsay Solis, real estate agent, mother of two beautiful, funny, hysterical girls that I love dearly as well. Um, she works on our Skydeck team, has been in hospitality forever, and she has such amazing insights and is also one of the funniest people I know. Oh, thank you. Hi, Lindsay. Now you got to live up to that. I know. Now I'm stressed <coughs> out about it. So let's back it up a little bit. Uh, introduce yourself a little bit. Tell everybody how you kind of started in your hospitality world, um, your catering company, how you kind of got to where you are now, real estate, just a little small condensed version, and we'll pick you apart on some questions All right. afterwards. Um, I started in nightlife when I became a single mom, so I was trying to figure out how to like do everything. So I started as a cocktail waitress, and then in that world, it just <clears> opened up. It's weird because it opens up doors, but you also get stuck in it. And that was my biggest fear becoming, there's this lady that works locally that's like 65 years old. That everyone's like, we don't want to be Joan. So there was that pressure to figure out how She's to get- nightlife? She is. She's in nightlife. She's like in her 60s. She does like the daytime opening. It's nightlife in the Inland Empire. It, it. Well, okay. So it's not like LA nightlife. Hey, I worked at dive number. We'll, 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 have <laughs> well, that's the thing. She'll make out with all the young guys, but I worked Definitely at dive call bars. call it 504. <laughs> <laughs> so- so um, I did that for a while and then worked my way into management and then ended up on Mike's team for Skydeck, which was out of nowhere. Yeah. Mike found me. I did, yo, we, yeah. were working, we were working one of the biggest show events I've ever worked in my life. It was a Coachella party with some people that I, I won't name because they weren't very good at what they were doing at the time. It's when you're running around <laughs> the desert? I've ran around the desert multiple times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Catch season one for that one. Yeah. I don't remember what episode, so you have to listen to them all. Listen to them all. There's definitely multiple we talked about. But she happened to be working the event as well, and she bitched out two of like my leads. And I was like, they're like, this this woman just yelled at us. I'm like, who is this girl? I want to meet her. Yeah. So I walk up to her, and she's thinking I'm going to like combat with her. I'm like, all right, you know, we're, we're cool. Like, what's your need? So we work together. And at the end of the show, I'm like, I could really use somebody like you on my team. And she's like, doing what? I'm like, it's really hard to explain, but... If you were looking to work a show, you'll make a lot of money. And she's like, all right, cool. And it was then- so creepy and it sounded so fake. So I started my own event company. So I did a lot of weddings, but somehow ended up with this way bigger gig than I was used to. They're like, we need 38 bartenders, like 42 servers. We need them three overnight shifts and we can't tell you what event it is. So my husband was like, that's fake. You're going to get ripped off. And like I am, I'm like, no, I'm going to do it. Let's just see. Because what's worst case scenario, we're going to make 20 grand off this. And so I was there and my I did. I yelled <clears> at all your Sky Deck boys because they were being wild. They were being little animals. And yeah. I didn't know who the f*** they were. I didn't know about Insomniac at the time. Like I knew of the shows like EDC, um, but I had no ties to like LA nightlife at all. So I yelled at him and then Mike offered me a job. He's like, hey, so um, I have this position. You can make like five grand. We'll put you up in a hotel. Uh, I'll send you an email. So I was like, all right, whatever. It seemed fake. And then I made good money and I kept coming back because I like the abuse. So Yeah. How many times have you heard that before in L.A.? Yeah. <laughs> Right? I, I want to put you in this movie. I'm, I'm going to make you hey, a star. I can't really explain Come the job because it apartment. makes no sense, but you're going to make money. I'm like, yeah. all well, right, whatever. Yeah. Like, Your husband was definitely like, who the f***? Is- no. He, yeah. Well, and he was there because I like whenever I would take on things that were too big, I always enlist him into my crazy projects. And he has like a real job. Like, not that our jobs aren't real, but he's suit and tie at a desk. So I had him out there like running ice for bartenders. And he's like, well, I was working hard. No one offered me a job. I'm like... Yeah, nobody wants your f-ing ass there. <laughs> Just look around. Of course, you didn't get offered a job. But then I saw how pretty the girls were, and I had like that was hard for me the first like year working for them. I started feeling really crappy about it. I was like, oh my god, these girls are so beautiful. Like it was intimidating yeah, to enter a, that world. Right. We've had a lot of those feelings. Like we all went through it. Oh, yeah. Everybody's like worried about the image, and you see that person like my he's working out he's ripped right and yeah so it's it's definitely a, a hard industry to be in and it you're is. beautiful yourself well, so like you. 
Yeah, but she was he just, calls me a 10 on the inside. That's that like their joke. That is not yes. true. Mike told me I was ugly one shift. I did not. He did. No, no, and he no, didn't no, have to no. say the words, no, but he did. No, 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 And I've no, never no, forgot no, it. No, 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 So now the you, whole thing is, well, you're a 10 on the no, inside. No, no, You I'm beat saying. yourself up constantly, <laughs> and you wouldn't hear what I was saying. It's like, well, at least you're a 10 on the inside. And then somebody else like, oh, I was like, don't and it's stuck. Oh yeah, and, and of stuck. course it's stuck. No, I love it. I know you guys just mess with me. <laughs> but yeah, when she when she first came in, like coming from like the way she was doing things, and then she came on to like EDC Vegas. So it's like we have a hundred cocktail waitresses that are all like the prettiest girls in the industry and work all all over the place. So it's like yeah, I can get how it's intimidating, but now she's their boss, and they all have to answer. To so her. they're all really nice <coughs> to me now. Yeah, it was it was weird at first. Yeah. Oh wait, so you started off as the boss. No, I started off as the cashier, like okay. the one that people would come to and bring their order in. So I was just sitting at a computer and- um, Yeah, on the festival side, like the girls don't, we don't let the girls ring in. There's too much going on. So it's not like at a nightclub when somebody takes the order, they go and they all have their own POS center. Yeah. One person rings it in. So we do one thing where at the financials the whole night because it's just too much can get messed up because oh, gotcha, gotcha. we're working in such large increments. Um, so she was the person who would just, she would handle all of the money. That's a I big that responsibility. Yeah. It was. Yeah. I had to learn how to count. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. It was rough. Hey, dude, I, I still counted on my fingers when I was bartending. Like, I still do it. Simple at uh, multiplication. Oh, not addition and subtraction. I'm just like eight, nine, ten. <laughs> I still do it. Same. So I became an actor. I can't do math. Like that. You, but you can pretend to, right? I can. You got it. I yeah. can't do math either, but that's why I have her. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but either way, so you, st you started with us and you came to realize real quick that there is a lot of ups and downs and like you're somebody me and her talk often i'm so grateful to have her on the team with me because we both deal with a lot of our own ang internal anxiety so like we rely a lot on each other so kind of tell us like what that was like because that definitely wasn't easy to kind of coexist with and you had to really learn how to navigate the crazy anxiety that this industry brings on top of real estate your marriage your kids yeah your kids are not easy these days no they're not and they have a lot of personality like you said i mean well, i have raised a lot of really kids. sarcastic kids <laughs> that will dish it out to people and i try not to like interrupt it but when we're there like if they're giving it to somebody i'm like oh it is they are who they are <laughs> i raised little mini me's um my biggest thing with the event industry specifically working with um that chapter of it outside of bartending is the crash. And I think mm. navigating like coming back into my real life and having kids and a husband. And so if we're gone six weeks and I come back, it's a huge transition mm. and a big crash. I feel like the last year has been better, but at first it was like a week in bed having to like turn off being the mom of the group and having to like navigate so many personalities. And I think it's a blessing and a curse that so many people come to me in that work setting to feel comfortable and help me work out their stuff. But at the same time, like I leave a lot of shows like what the f just happened. And did that bleed into like your actual family life of having to be an actual mom? I think it, I'm disconnected when I'm on the road. So I have to really carve out time to like, talk to them because I can turn it off and I'm like, okay, now I'm in work mode. We're traveling, we're doing this, we're up, we're up all night. And I have to like, honestly write myself notes. To, like I haven't talked to him in two days, make sure you call. And they're good with it, but there's a little bit of guilt that you get from like being in a marriage and disappearing for six weeks. And even though you're bringing home money and you're like, but look at what I did. Yeah. They're sitting there like, I just had to leave my job twice a day to like, for him, get kids to school and get them everywhere else. So it's a lot of guilt that I like carry around for that. So like, but why do you, I mean, obviously I can understand where the guilt comes from, but like, I can only speculate, like what's the actual guilt that you hold from it? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, because I don't make the efforts, maybe like he would think you would make because you're so engulfed in this weird reality when you're on the road and you know, like everything in the outside world is turned off. You are waking up at eight, <clears> you're on site and you're there till four and you're getting four hours of sleep and you're doing it again and again and again. When she's saying eight to four, it's not 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. She's saying like, we're getting up at 8 a.m. And getting back to we're hotel going at 4 a.m. Yeah. Like it's like an 18, 20 yeah. hour shift Fun that time. we're doing. So you turn your brain off to anything else, which has been like a weird thing. And I think that's the theme of my life, like navigating, balancing everything because I've been so busy in the real estate world and I have so many clients that I work with and then I disappear for two weeks and I have people handling my stuff for me. Having to like not turn it off completely has been a little difficult for sure. So when, when you go back, mm -hmm. like how are you when you go back though and you're, you step back into the mom role? 
I have a lot of anxiety going back, but once I'm in, I'm in. I mean, it used to take like a week to get back into the groove. And I would like tell my other boss for real estate, like, oh, I don't get back like extra days until I would. Um, so I'd be home, take a couple days to just hibernate and be a recluse. But now I've I've had a better job like transitioning into it. It's more of a mental state. Like before I get back, I start like two days before <clears throat> being more active with my job and gearing up essentially for it. Shit. So you're working a festival and you're doing the real estate and mm-hmm. you're running a family basically. Barely, yeah, yeah, but yeah. doing that too. Yeah. So she'll have two <laughs> she'll have she'll have two computers up sometimes, whereas like she's checking and doing payroll here for the festival and going through and making sure all the numbers add up. But then over here she's going back and forth when she gets a second because she's got a real estate contract here because she's got to be an escrow before this day, which happens to be tomorrow, but we still have another show day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, that's the crazy thing about the event world is that, like, there's only a couple of us that really get to have it, sup- you know, supplement my whole income and be my whole life for everybody else. Like, it's a bit more of a side gig. But like you said, there is so much that you put into it where, like, yo, when we're on the road, it's it's like you it's like you're living in a different world because, like, nothing else exists besides that. It's so hectic. It's so and you're so disconnected. It's like pretty much like if you were to shut your phone off for a couple of days, that's what we're doing, but we're in a high intensity, high energy environment the whole time. And your significant other's people outside of it who aren't in it with you don't get it. They don't get it. I had to invite him to an EDC, like as a guest. I said, why don't you just come and see what it is? And once he saw our schedule and how little we do have, like the bitching about it stopped. Yeah. And that's not a nice way to say it. But the arguments we would have when I was on the road of not reaching out ended because he was like, damn, I didn't realize you guys like don't stop. I'm like, yeah, I fucking told you. Like, So how much of that crash really takes your anxiety and your depression to different like tolls? Because, you know, we've had long conversations of days you're just like, yo, I just, I can't get out of bed. I I give into it. I can't function. I give into it. I mean, there's shows that I leave and I don't feel that. And that's where I think that I've navigated a little better, but I still get it here and there. And I just give into it. Instead of fighting it and feeling miserable, I let myself stay in bed. I let myself disconnect and have the time because there is no working through it. There's no working through it quicker than it is. Like if I'm crashing, I'm crashing. Yeah. You can't force Mm -hmm. when when you're just, when when you're not there and you're, you, you, yeah, you have to like just succumb to what your body's telling you. hundred percent. Right. You can't force it. Like Go exercise. Yes, yeah, it's, it's good to go exercise and all that, but sometimes you're just overworked. Yeah. And you need to step back and, and take that me time to just do nothing. Which is hard to do. Like, I'm not a big step back person. And I, th- I did close up shop on my event company when I got more serious with uh, the festival world. And so that was in 2020. And I stopped doing that. So I did take some stuff off my plate just to open up time for like being a mom. That was really important to like look at it and go, okay, what's what's working for me and what's not. Obviously, I can't get rid of the kids. It's way past that date that you can get rid of them. So we're still there. So they're staying. <laughs> like, And they're only getting older and more demanding. So that was staying. My income for both of these jobs, uh, real estate and festivals, is so significant. So as much as my event company was my baby, it was the one that had to like leave. But I wasn't sad about it. It was a really good move. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So like you said, you like... You got to step back into being a mom, but when you're crashing and you're exhausted, how hard is that to juggle? Because like you're saying, no, you're turning off, but you really don't get to turn off. Yeah, you could turn off from, you could turn off from me calling you and not answering my phone calls or shutting your fucking email down. But if your kids are calling you at like work or like, you know, I'm sure, I don't know exactly what your kids go through, but yeah, let's be real. The world's a place and kids are being bullied your kids are at the age of really getting into that world of social media really having an involvement on them things that they're really dealing with are getting really hard for them so how are you able to juggle that because you just don't like i can shut it off you really can't no you're uh, right. in all honesty yeah i mean i don't shut it off completely obviously my kids are like the priority i have a f- uh, almost 15 year old so she has a lot that she um is going through with high school and her first boyfriend and they just had their first kiss and we celebrated that so oh. we surprised her with balloons that said congrats and she almost died of embarrassment at school um <laughs> But, and then I have- Wait, Hold on, you sent <laughs> balloons to your kid's school? My husband said, did, Cody did. Congrats yeah. on your first kiss? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yo, man. If your kids are getting, you just literally opened the door to have them get bullied even more. Yeah. Just, She'll just be so. fine. She'll be fine. I mean, they dated a year and a half and they just had their first kiss and I was doing way worse shit at that age. So I was I celebrated it. Please you know? share. No, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how, how I ended up- How old you your first kiss? My first kiss? 
I was, oh, kid, I was 20. And he was like 10 years older than me. And then um, I had another one because it was going so well when we were broken up. I got pregnant again. And so uh, I chose to do that again. So we had two. And then he ended up getting addicted to heroin and kind of disappeared. Uh, and that's when I ended up in nightlife because I looked at it and I moved in with my parents for a year and they said I can stay as long as I want. And I said to myself, I'm going to be here a year and I'm going to figure it out. So I was in school to be in nursing school and decided I was going to start working at a bar and it paid my bills and it made it so that I could like do everything I needed to do with them. And financially. a lot of people take that route. It's like a blessing and a curse. It made it so I could do all the things I needed to do. And I ended up where I am. But it's the curse of it was a really dark time in my life. It opened my door to like really negative men that I dated. And I really believe that a lot of men that are super controlling do seek out single moms that are freshly single. And I see it with all my friends that go through it. And so there was just this door that was open to negativity, but it was also a blessing because I was able to do the things I needed to do. I didn't have to live with my parents long. I was able to buy my kids the things they needed and be on my own and support them. So I still look at it as a positive thing, but I look back at that time in my life and I'm like, God, those are some dark years. I can't imagine like bartending, working in that environment and then having a kid. Yeah. I used to sit them at the bar. They were, they were little because they're teens now and preteen. But um, they would sit at the bar and do their homework until somebody could pick them up. So they grew up in it and they have wild stories. Like I have a terrible memory. So I, I'd love to sit here and be like, this is the crazy thing that ever happened. But they'll tell people, they'll be like, one time we were at my mom's work and this guy came in and said she had big boobs and it was really weird. And I'm like, oh my God, how do they even Next remember time that? on the chaos. <laughs> yeah. Like they have even Sadie crazier. and maybe Solish joining yep. the chaos. First yep. family member. First family Yeah. I always think I'm like, gosh, their memories are going to be so weird. <laughs> like... But, but they're probably going to have like a good um, sense of common sense and like what it's like to be out in the real world, real world and deal with real people. Well, and- one says she wants to be a bartender when she goes to college. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. If I mean, but that's the time to do it. Though. It is the like- time to do it. I mean, I obviously I'm going to support them in whatever they want to do. But it's just funny. She? She's 11. She's going to be. 12. Oh, yeah. When she gets old enough. Tell her to listen to this podcast. Yeah, listen to the <laughs> podcast. Don't do it. <laughs> You're going to struggle. If you do do it, we'll tell you, we'll tell you what, what to, to do. Avoid. Don't yeah. make the same mistakes we did, even though you will. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's part of the journey, right? Right. Comes it. Her daughter's, yo, the best wedding speech I've ever heard. It wasn't a speech. She grilled me. It was uh, an her, open so roast at my wedding given by my like child. For like five minutes. And she was, what, nine at the time? Yeah. Yo, it was the funniest, funniest speech I've ever heard at a wedding. We were all crying. Yeah. Like she was just shitting on her. Is yeah. that is that a um video? It's online. It's online. Wait, insert. It's somewhere. <laughs> it got like forty thousand likes and a hundred thousand views and like not that long, but she was super funny. I was nervous too leading up to my mom's like, hey, Sadie wants to make a speech at your wedding. And I'm like, oh, because anytime Sadie opens her mouth and says, My mom, I cringe. I'm like, what the f- is she going to say? Because it's usually a real story and I'm not something I want shared. So I was like, okay, can somebody have her practice her speech and kind of vet it out and make sure it's appropriate? And the three people that listened to it came up grinning ear to ear. They're like, it's good. It's good. It's fine. She's going to do it. And I'm like, yes. okay. And the whole time I was sitting there, I'm like, oh my God. I mean, she ripped me. It wasn't oh, yeah. mean. It was funny, but it was good. She's funny. It was hysterical. So what's it like now navigating teenagers? Because like going back to it, it, it's so funny that your husband sent that. I can see Cody doing that, sending it. But like, yo, kids are really cruel nowadays. They are. So like, do you do you experience your daughters dealing with anything on that aspect? And like, how do you as a mom kind of help in that situation? Because like we were talking about earlier, the way the world is is like. School is trying to teach your kids one way, but you're also trying to teach your kids how to have boundaries and stand up for themselves. Like, how do you flirt that line? Because that can't be easy right now. Uh, You just do it. So I'm just doing it the way I think is right. So I tell them to advocate for themselves. And I tell them, and uh, it's cute because they want to be liked by their teachers and they want to follow the rules as the school's designed to make them. And so they'll tell me things like, oh, no, I can't do that, uh, my teacher. And I say, advocate for yourself. Your teachers are just humans. So if you truly believe you don't need to be sitting next to somebody that's making you uncomfortable, you get to move. I don't like have your teacher call me is usually my famous line. Have your teacher call me then. 
Have them call me because at the end of the day, they don't want none of this. I did sit back and let it pretty much. No, I'm nice, (laughs) but I mean, I'm known to be outspoken. I sent an email to their school and I think sometimes I fire off emails and then later I go, oh, I probably should have waited five minutes (laughs) because I'm not that angry anymore. But I fired off an email that, I mean, I was putting links to different uh, articles talking about body image and it was that. The girls couldn't wear bikinis. They had to wear T-shirts or something Mm -hmm. over one pieces. And the boys were allowed to go shirtless. And of course, I'm like, what the f***? (laughs) That's not Why? It didn't make sense to me. So I was just going through all that with the teachers. And unfortunately, the school they're at is a really small school. So they're stuck with the same teacher for a couple of years. Well, my younger one now has those teachers for four years. And she came home. She goes, I just want to let you know, my teacher doesn't like you. (laughs) I'm like, I don't even like me. So (laughs) shocking. But wait, like what other things, though? Because like I've I've never heard that before. Like what? Like obviously we grew up in a very different time period. So what are some of the other that like is different that you're noticing that you're like, yo, this doesn't make sense Old that you're shit. having a problem. With. Like if they're getting picked on, which my little one's getting bullied really bad at school right now and they're getting picked on, their solution <clears throat> is to continue to tell them you're cute. People are jealous of you or the boy likes you. And I just feel like that's really bad ex- advice. Even if that's the case, right? Even if it is this boy has a crush and he's being mean, that's not the message I want to send to my girls growing up that someone that's mean to you, that means they like you. Because then what do we do? As adults, we're chasing the guy that's not called us and we're going, I think he likes me. He's not talking to me. He's being mean to me. He's such calls- a dick. Yeah, but he's such I a think dick, there's a chance. So hot. So um, it's kind of going, not going, I don't, I wouldn't consider it going against the grain, but it's looking at these old school thought processes and knowing my kids are exposed to them at school and making sure I'm the loudest voice because I'm not the only voice. As I know, I'm not going to be the only influence. If I can be the biggest, strongest one, then maybe they'll hear what I'm saying. So I constantly find myself saying the opposite. And of course, I end it with, of course, respect your teacher. I, I don't want the little asshole kid and the mom being like, well, I, that's how I taught them. But it's a fine line to navigate and just what, what feels right. And how does uh, uh, social media play into <clears throat> all of this? Yeah, do, do you do you mind us asking you questions? Because obviously we want to yeah, respect your kids and everything, respect no, you. But fine. like, do you mind us? They're fine. Ta- they're fine. They're no, raised j- with me. Well, no, just because like because this is such a big topic in the world, mm-hmm. and like we haven't really had this conversation with anybody. But there are so many people that listen to the show and friends of ours that have kids, and like I can't even fathom what that must be like. Like not only what it takes when you're told, but like as a mother, that's gotta kill you to see your child like hurting like that. Yeah, it does. So yeah, back to okay, cool. Let's social media. Yeah. Open f- season. Yeah, Let's ask all these questions. <laughs> okay, about social media. So, yeah, how to social navigate media it with first. Them. Yeah, like. Um, I mean, it's a lot of. There's two types of parents. There's parents that just give their kids all of it and access to it, and then there's, there's other parents that are trying to hold on to some sort of like youth with their kids, right? And I'm trying to find somewhere in the middle. There's going to be no benefit to completely shut them out to it right? They're going to have to learn to navigate it. And so, um, and then I've also learned the hard way. So we gave them a Snapchat and I won't say which kid it was, but she was entirely too young to be sending the eggplant emoji. Right. And so I'm horrified here. and I'm, I'm on a work, uh, work trip with them, right. With Skydeck. And so I'm in a hotel, I'm like running late as usual to site. And I get a call from my husband with a bunch of text messages, a screenshots of our daughter's phone. And he's wanting me to handle it. Again, this is that whole balancing thing. And I'm like, Hey, like I have to be in, I have to be downstairs. They're all in the car waiting for me. We're going to site. And he's like, well, look what your daughter did and sends me this. And it's funny. Like they used it in the right way. <laughs> oh but no. I'm like, okay, that's it. And it's hard because I think a lot of the stuff they do is funny. And a lot of the jokes, like they get sexual into windows now because they're at that age and so I joke with them a lot and I get in trouble Cody's always like uh why are you talking to them about that and I'm like well they know what it means and he's like no so kind of like finding that balance obviously I'm not gonna like tell them I like anal sex or anything like I'm not being disgusting but I like (laughs) well I'm not saying I do I'm just saying you're not saying you don't either I'm not not saying I do because what if they hear this but um because they are on social media what, I still joke with them. Like if, I don't know, something pops up, like I make a joke, I know they get it and they laugh. I feel like if they can't talk pops comfortably, pops, pops in, pops up somewhere around, somewhere there. I mean, giving them some access and if they start, you guys pull it together. If they can't <laughs> handle it, reeling it back in, which is hard because then you're yeah, the worst yeah. mom ever and all my friends get to do it and that's hard to navigate. And it's I say what every other parent says, like, well, I'm not their mom. So go live with them, have them adopt you. Like it's not me. So we did Instagram at 14. 
So they get Instagram at 14. Snapchat went away after the eggplant emoji. Um, TikTok is a fine line because my youngest is very girly and like she wasn't doing anything inappropriate, but you have to think of the weirdos out there. So even though she's a dancer and a really talented dancer, I'm looking at the videos from different eyes of like, okay, I see my child dancing and doing the splits and that's a really normal like thing for her because she's a dancer, but there's weirdos online that are going to be looking different. So just, and then, so I had to take TikTok away. And so I was the worst mom ever. So, I mean, social media is one way it happens, but like I heard like it's just so much more terrible in schools now because teachers like don't teachers don't want to get involved because they don't want to hear it because like parents and all these people that are just causing f-ing all these m- issues for no f- I don't want to say for no reason because I, re- I really don't know. But like how hard is it for kids to go to school nowadays? And like and is that something you have to worry about? I think so. I mean, it's hard. I think the thing that stresses me out more than so the teachers is every day dropping them off worrying about a shooting. That is something that is on my Mm -hmm. mind from the time I drop them off. Obviously, I work and I'm super distracted. Mm -hmm. So I have moments where I'm not thinking about it. It's not all day. But every morning my kids get out of the car and say, be safe, be vigilant, be aware. And obviously, I love you. But my last message to them is like, look around and if something feels off, bolt. So my 11-year-old came home and said, oh, we did an active shooter drill today. And it just feels real. This is her. She goes, it just feels really weird that they want us to sit in the room and wait for the shooter to come in. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Like, that is weird. Like, what do you think about that? She's like, I feel like if I have a a choice, I'm going to run. And because they go to, she goes to school in the mountains. I'm going to run, hop the fence and hide in the woods. And I said, then do it. She's like, but my teachers won't let us leave the room. I said, if you feel unsafe, use your intuition. I trust you and I'm going to support you. So if you feel like sitting in a room waiting for a shooter to come in is unsafe and you feel you have the access or the the opportunity to run and hide, then I want you to do that. So that's, I always try to empower them to trust their gut, which is the opposite of what the school system teaches them. Just the fact that that has to be a conversation that is had on a regular basis with parents that you have to have a conversation with your, with, with your kids about. And the fact that there is a school shooting more days of the year than we actually have days is just beyond f-ing asinine and ridiculous. Again, not touching on politics, but like, just why does it not with like, it? Cl- like, um, yo, anytime we go into a festival, there's something like, wrong mm-hmm. with that. Like anytime I honestly, like anytime I go anywhere, but like, especially at work, I can't even imagine what it must be like to have a parent knowing that this is happening so continuously. Well, you wonder if you're doing the right thing. So like, I know I don't have the, I don't have the patience to homeschool my kids. I just don't. But you do tr- question, am I being crazy by sending them? That's like a question but I it's ask also like, I don't have another option. They're we're, going. We're supposed, like, as citizens, we're supposed to trust in the in these departments and these procedures to help our kids, to put them in a safe place, to teach them an education. But it's like, you're not holding up your end of the bargain. Right. So we're putting in, we're following a curriculum that you're saying we need to know on that you're saying we need to do and that you're paying for, whether it's a private school or out of your tax dollars, and it's not safe. So like, why I can see why a lot of people wouldn't want to put their kids in school. And plus what we know, there's not a single thing I learned in the education system that has actually helped me. True. At, I still have not used the Pythagorean theorem. I don't, it does not. And then on top terrible of that. terrible with grammar. So the day they, they there, it doesn't. <laughs> like. And all of that adds to mental health massive anxiety yeah like you're not just dealing with bullying you're dealing with no how do you expect the kid, how do you expect to yeah how do you expect a kid to be able to be focused in a classroom if they're thinking about oh we just did an active shooter drill how do you expect your kid to go into the next period and actually do well on a test because they probably just internally are freaking out because they have no idea like what the f- they or don't, really I don't even grasp. Know, maybe it's just normal to them like i that i'm might, sure they are internalizing thing, it right But it's been all they've known and it trips me out because it freaks me out. And I asked my daughter about it that's 15 because they had uh, three or four of the high schools around us all went on lockdown a week ago. And somebody thought it would be funny to call the schools and say they're going to shoot them up. And they had like cops rushing in and they were on lockdown and we had everybody's kids are reaching out to them scared. Um, I had found out it was a hoax before they had called my daughter's school. So I had texted her and I said, hey, there's a hoax going on. All the schools are on lockdown, but they're starting to take them off. So by the time her school went on lockdown, which is probably not good that I told her that, she's like, don't worry, mom. I was in class telling everyone it was fake and that they didn't need to follow the directions. I'm like, no, no, I was just letting you know not to freak out. Don't like, what if it wasn't? So she was (laughs) so unaffected. So I touched base with her when she got home and she's like, no, I'm fine. Like it was just another day at school, like got under the table. 
I never even thought of that to be completely it's so honest. normal right. to them. Like, like for us, it seems so absurd. But like you said, like they grew up in it, so it's like, yeah, wow. I, I never even thought about that. Like that's their. Th that's disgusting. That that's, that's their normal. That's the norm. That's, that's the norm. norm. That is. And we have failed as a society. As honestly. a kid, though, you don't ever feel like anything's gonna happen to you, right? Like. I remember being 14, 15, getting in cars with grown-ups that I shouldn't have been hanging out with and driving up and down the mountain to go drink, right? Now as an adult, I'm like, I've had one. I shouldn't like walk across the street. What if I yeah. get hit? So as a kid, you're not. It, it probably doesn't feel real to them for the most part. They're prob Most of them, I'm sure there are some that are debilitated with fear, but I think most of them are just like, oh, that's never going to happen to us. That happens at other schools. That happens to other kids. It doesn't feel real, I think, at least to my kids. I think to, I think that's like it to everybody. I don't, I don't mean, I think that you don't lose that as you grow up until like it actually happens. To right. You. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know I was going to be paralyzed at 33, you know, like yeah. from doing something I love, right. riding a bike. Right. You know? I mean, let's even go before that. Like you're growing up in New Orleans the whole time. You never thought in your life that, oh, a natural disaster was going to hit where I was and I have to change my whole lifestyle. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like obviously it happens, but you never thought it'd be something so devastating. Yeah. And even after all that, I still don't think that something bad, another bad thing is going to happen. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, you got to get bad thing out of the way. Yeah. Because right. yeah, it only happens a once. A couple. Don't give me more. <laughs> yeah. Please don't teach me a lesson. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm good. <laughs> no, no more lesson. I'm good. But like, I, I don't believe in like living your life in fear either even though there's so much to be fearful of right you know i, I think i don't know man i i go back and forth on that because i don't like to leave my house because of people that's just number one but like yo I, I being in the in the vicinities we were in so much like talk about living in fight or flight with anxiety and depression now put me in a situation where i'm already stressed already dealing with my anxiety and then now i'm like oh f we're in a massive gathering there is a we are a target. I feel that way like, at movie theaters. So I look, I, every time I, I look at movie, theater, movie I theater, theater, I feel And I, I don't know if my anxiety was ever as bad as it was in, except for the last 10 years. 10 years, it's gone like, it's become more real. Yeah. But I probably self-medicated more back then. You know, now I'm a, you know. I think it's just more apparent to us now. And like, we're, from, I mean, I think it's happening more, but maybe it was happening more back in the day. We just didn't know about it because of social media and the news covered different things. But like, yeah, I mean, it, that happened once in a movie theater. Now, every time you think about it, when I go to a movie, I wait weeks when it comes out and then I go when there's nobody in the yeah, theater. Yeah, when nobody wait, wants to. And I'll yeah. wait and I just try to avoid spoilers. But but you're right. Like, I, you know, I say I don't like to live in fear, but I, I am more aware of what, what yeah. I do. And I, and I question things that, oh, I might get hurt doing that. You know, it's I actually think about stuff yeah. that. Right. I, I put myself in the future, my future, okay, that I, I could end up this way. So let me just avoid that altogether and avoid that danger. Are you a homebody? I, I am. I became more of a homebody in like the past few years. I just, yeah. Do we me too. I mean, we're, we talk about this all the time. Do we think that people became a homebody just because we're like, oh, all this shit going on, it's not worth it? Because it seems like a lot of people we know have become that way. Or did the pandemic really kind of take us and put you there and you're kind of like now like, I don't really want to kind of leave. I don't know if there was a pandemic for me. It was when I stopped bartending after being in a bar five to seven nights a week. And once I like settled down and got married and then had a different career path, like you couldn't pay me to go out. I mean, you could probably pay me, but I did. That's not right, my first right. choice. You, yeah, could, exactly. you could definitely pay me to go out, you but do a lot of things, it's not you know my saying? first thing. Like I love being at home. I love being in my pajamas and I'm just not that fun. Also, my husband's you know, the opposite. You know what? Like, I, I feel like before- <laughs> Your husband's not in the industry. That's, that's true. The difference. He sits at a desk. He wants to get out. And I'm like, ooh, I'll yeah. pick you up and drop you off. And like the social battery for me is just uh, not as, as not there. full as, and it's harder to recharge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Well, we and don't I don't want to give myself to people like, I, I don't feel the need to tell strangers my story a hundred times. Like, that's right. just so depleting. Right. Yeah. You know? It's the same thing. I remember being behind the bar and towards the end, I knew I was done, but it was when people would ask me for drinks. Physically, I would go, <sighs> Right? Like, I was such if it, a bitch. If it, was, if it wasn't a beer, I'm yeah. f***ing pissed. And I'd be so mean to people about it. And I was like, oh, that's not right. Like, that's actually what I'm here to do. But I didn't want to be talked to. I didn't want to work. I was done. You want a mojito right now? Yeah, right now. Well, I was I'm, never I'm good at that. I'm 10 deep. My claim you want eight mojitos. Was, I could make really mediocre drinks as quickly as possible. Yeah. But if you wanted something that tasted good, you had to go to somebody else. So. Nah, if, can I get an adios, motherfucker? No, motherfucker. 
Or you're not in high school. <laughs> right, right. No, drink something legit. Ew, you know who used to always order those and embarrass me when I was a bartender? Cody, my husband. Oh, yeah. We'd go to bars and be like, can I get an AMF? And I'm like, no. stop. You're not allowed. No. no. We judge you automatically. I judge you. As a bartender, I, like, anybody in the hospitality industry, if you come up and order that, we're like, no, he no, orders no, you don't, it. you're not no. here. And he's you're an not adult, like a big adult. I met him at the bar, though, so. I guess that that came out of it. A marriage, yeah, right? Of course. All my close friends. What's he drinking now? It. Uh, vodka. Long Island's vodka water. Tell us how you really vodka. feel about it. Yeah. What? How, how do you really feel about it, Kim? We love you, Cody. We love you, by the way. I'm, yeah, I love Cody. He's not gonna We're watch just it. <laughs> better. He doesn't pay attention. Yeah, <laughs> he can't. When he meets people and like I'm going and I'm like doing my thing and I'm loud and saying nasty things, he always has his hands in his pockets because he's just quiet. He's super quiet until he's not. And people always look at him and go, is she like this all the time? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And they go, it doesn't bother you? And he's like, no, mm -mm, that's just who she is. So he'll call it, like, we'll be laughing at the jokes and we'll be sitting there and he'll be like, I've heard this nine times. Yeah. It's not yeah, funny yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now he tries to take away the funniness. I'm like, they haven't heard it. Relax. Don't embarrass me in front of my friends. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got off track. We, we no, first no. on chaos control right there. No, no, we... But no, we we're having a good conversation about no, we, we where were like, everything's uh, at. Just there's everything's at in the world. That we we're just kind of talking about, yeah, how like uh, I mean, different like what what we're enduring and like how for kids, it's just like yeah, I, I really still am baffled thinking about it. Like yo, that that is their reality. But like, how did we come so far? Like their reality from ours isn't that many years apart at this point. No, but a lot's happened. I mean, what the first school like Columbine was when we were kids, right? Yeah. A lot's happened. They've dealt with like weird stuff too, though, like COVID and being out of school completely. I think they're so resilient. I love Gen Z. Like I am such an advocate for them. And I know they do weird things like eat Tide Pods and all that stuff everyone likes to make fun of. But I feel like that's a small price we pay for having like a really cool group of kids coming up because there's, they have millennial parents. Yeah, yeah. There's a Tide Pod kids and then there's the activist kids. Yeah. Like the ones that are doing shit. But, but people like we're on them like our generation didn't have something stupid yeah, what did that we, we get we labeled with for. Pogs, you guys. That we get labeled for. And like, we traded pogs like slammers, dude, all day. We, we all had little That's tamagotchis amazing. we took care of. Yeah. But like we had stupid things that we would do. So it's just like, why are we harping on them for that? And it's like, no, I, I agree with you. I love the resiliency where it's like all the older generations are really shitting on them because they're making a change that the older generations don't it. like. I, I'm a huge fan of what they're doing. They don't like what's happening. They're working on changing it. They're taking the active steps to change it. They're also pushing back on like the system where they're like, I don't like this schooling and shit. And everyone's like, oh, it's such like, oh, the, the idea that there's a school for influencers and content creation. It's like, there that's is. a legitimate, yeah, it's like, that's a legitimate craft now. That's a legitimate thing. It's a Why career. Wouldn't, People yeah. are making like so, amazing careers out Yeah, and like you're shitting on a kid for going after their dream and being artistic because they're not doing what society says. Like, oh, they should be going to college. Most of these kids now are making money, millions of dollars before they even get to college. How are you going to tell them, go get an education and not keep doing what's yeah. making Go put millions. yourself 120000 in debt so you can make 60000 a year. Like, that's a hard thing to sell them. I, how many people do, do we work with that have degrees and they never use them? All of us, you know? All of, all right? of us. <laughs> every, every single person here in this. I never made set, it that far. Everybody but... that works on our Skydeck team, we've all been to college because that was what we had to do. We're all in debt. And we're all running nightlife events and none of us, fing, I never went to school for, fing, uh, uh, for events. Well, look at what it opens. It opens doors. Like, look where you guys are with your podcasts. Well, I mean, all, all like nightlife really does catapult you. And there is that small part or that part. I don't know how small it is because there's a lot of people that get stuck in it. But if you could take it and use it as a stepping stone and not get sucked into such like the negative part of it, it really does open doors. But, yeah. there's, but there's such a stigma. Like I had such a hard time grasping with the fact that this is what I was doing as a career because everybody back home was like, oh, you're just like bartending. Like it's not a regular job. And I always looked at it as a side gig and I put so much pressure on myself to find something else when it's like, why? This has opened up way more doors than anything else that was the number one question people always ask me like what else do you do i'm like nothing what do you do like you're sitting at a bar at 4 p.m like do you right, want to compare right, right. who's doing better right now <laughs> but, but when but when your life is and you're having a hard time you guess who here. you're hitting up yeah for a release and for something to do me so you yeah and like complaining about how your life is and how you hate your family yeah. and and then tell us oh your job must be nice and it's like no you like i i have hard times too like you. Right. Or the saying like thinking like uh, bartending or nightlife is like easy money. I always think it's quick money, but it's definitely not easy. Oh, There's such a toll. And I think that's 
probably where your guys' podcast comes in. Like there's such a mental toll outside of physical. Yeah. Emotional. Those are dark. Yeah. Mental, but like I always look at it as emotional because it's like, yo, especially when we were TSAs, pe- like people look, and even as a cocktail waitress, you're being degraded. You're being looked down on. You're not looked at as a human being. If you're a cocktail waitress, you're an object. And if you're a TSA or a busser, you're looked at as a servant. 100%. Like we're here to take care of your means no matter what you do to us. Like how many people have treated us like sh- and talk so down to us well that like was something okay. i had to learn so and i've taken it with me in real estate because there are awkward moments i think of being a woman in business in general is i have men like get awkward and weird at empty houses and it puts you in a weird position um recently i had a client who was getting weird on text message with me and so i the beginning of my nightlife career, I did like let people say whatever. I would giggle, play stupid, act dumb just to get through it. Like, cause my mindset was, oh, well, I need them to tip me. And then I learned near 30, I think when I started to get close to my thirties, all of a sudden I was done. And I'm like, these people are going to tip what they're going to tip. I'm not going to get sexually harassed. I had somebody masturbate under a bar while making eye contact with me and then told me what he was doing dead serious at and that was an 11 a.m shift like i've run into really weird people jesus but and i didn't stick up for myself then i went and told what the are you cook, doing at bars at 11 a.m bro bar- damn masturbating it. damn it you found me <laughs> why not yeah <laughs> but it's even easier if you're sitting down behind be under the bar and stuff. <laughs> i mean he was sitting but it was so and i knew he was doing something weird but i didn't <laughs> get what was going on until he told me and so even then, like he told I, you, yes, he told me what he was doing, and so I went and got Gotta the love cook. The honesty. And there was no bouncer Talk about it. at eleven a.m. Somebody a tip. Yeah, yeah. Just he wanted tip. to give me more than the tip, but I don't even think that guy ever tipped either. That was the <laughs> thing. Like Shocking. that was one of those guys that Shocking. came in that you're like, oh god, here we go. I'm gonna get fifty cents off his three fifty beer. Oh my. God. Um, but I told the cook, and the cook had him taken out. But even in that moment, I didn't like speak up for myself because I was the bartender and that's what you deal with. And that's the owners would say things like, oh, well, it comes with the job. And you're like, no, like that doesn't come with it. So shifting into learning how to speak up in those moments and be like, it's not about the money. The money doesn't make it worth it. I'm not going to keep my mouth shut if somebody's making me feel uncomfortable. And now I've taken that into real estate because you are in homes with different characters and not everyone always has good intentions. And I'm not saying they're not trying to buy homes, but if they're like being awkward about getting you into bedrooms and sending you weird texts when their wives aren't included in the group text or whatever it is, I speak up now. I say, like, I'm willing to work with you, but I'm not willing to work with you if you're going to act like that. Because to me, I'm like, I make en- not, I'm not like rolling in the dough, but I make enough money to feel confident to be like, that's not worth my time. Wait, so that's what you happened when you were bartending. Mm-hmm. Let me, I, I want to hear on both the real estate side and now being like a manager on the Skydeck side, the most f-ed up or close to the most f-ed up thing that you've dealt with <sighs> being in that scenario on the real, on both sides. Um, Both sides, I think. For bartending, it would be that, or I had someone follow me home and break into my house when I was inside. And that was, I mean, I didn't sleep in my house for five months after that. That was scary. Uh, festival? I don't, I mean, festival. I mean, we've had some people that have, that talk down to us quite yeah, often. Yeah, they'll treat you like maybe you're a little less than and you get to roll with it. Um, but I don't think I, I haven't, I was in the back. So I was like behind a computer for many of the years dealing with cocktails. So I have a lot of stories about that. But as far as clients, clients, clients weren't giving me a hard time. Um, now that I'm more in the front, I'm sure I'll have some stories another time, but I don't really have many for that one. It's more the people that we work with. Most of the time you can gauge. Now you're like, you know what? I'm just going to have Mike or Chris come deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> I don't For the do. most part. Yeah. yeah. And uh, to be real and not to make it like about a sexist thing, some men, <clears throat> especially men with money, don't want to deal with women. And they don't want to hear it from you and they want a guy to tell them. So even if I'm like, oh, no, I'm the manager, like that's not going to happen, whatever. They're like, I I want to talk to Mike or I want to talk to Chris. And it's like, they're going to tell you the same thing. But if you need to hear it from someone with a penis, I'll go get them for you. Like, that's fine. It's true, though. How many times that happens? All the time. All the time. All the time. All the time. So you've been awesome to talk to and we appreciate your insight because definitely we haven't had somebody kind of come in and give us that aspect on being a mom and dealing with bullying. And I think you've definitely shared a really cool perspective, like I said, for me and I think other people as well of like, yo, it's just this is the norm. And I think we really need to do something to change that. Um, But shifting more back to you and as we get everybody out of here. Okay. First, first, give us your favorite craziest nightlight moment that you've had. And then secondly, 
what's the thing you appreciate most about this journey you've been on throughout the industry, real estate, family, friends, that can like really help other people that are in your position kind of give you something to look at to inspire them because I'm sure there's a ton of the people that are struggling with their kids, dealing with bullying and trying to just keep themselves going. It's so hard nowadays. Okay, let me think. So my craziest story. Or favorite, doesn't have to be crazy. Or favorite. I honestly, I don't know, you guys. There's been so, I have one of horrible memory and I feel like I block a lot of it out. Um, I don't really have a good one. I feel like I said a good one. Any good Mikey stories? Any good Mikey stories? No. Mm -mm. He's pretty boring on site. Yeah. yeah. Nothing's really going <laughs> yeah. on there. I mean, I don't know. I think like something that's been crazy to me is like, uh, honestly, like overdoses and things like that. Like, and it's such a norm on like how to deal with it. Like we're just in this crazy industry where like people are getting drunk. Or I don't know, a girl pooped her pants one time on a bar stool. Oh, we always love the pooping pants. <laughs> yeah, dude. I don't know. That was season <laughs> one, that was like a theme of our season. I mean, dude. was it? <laughs> yeah. No, why is everyone pooping at bars she, when they get in drunk? in a club? I don't know. It's just people seem Please, to do it. Please, give us that one. Yeah. I, she just pooped on the bar stool, but she was hanging off of it. And I can't handle things like that. Like if we keep talking about it, I'll gag. Um, yeah. It was yeah. bad. But then again, I laughed so hard when I was working one time, I peed on a bar stool. So. I'm no different. But I wasn't drunk. That's just because I had kids and they ruined my bladder. Yeah. Or when I sneeze. And then you're like trying to bartend and you know your pants are wet and you're like, oh, I just laugh so hard I peed. Yeah. It happens, man. Yeah, you know? Well, not shit, it just happens. pee. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I've just... So many of those like memories, like maybe I don't think they're crazy because they were so common. Yeah. So like even to think, I'm like, I don't know, every night was so weird. I mean, I worked at bars where uh, every dive bar I worked at, people lived on top of it. So there'd be like those crazy regulars that were coming down. I called them the bottom feeders. So they'd come in around like 145 when the music was going down. They do like this specific guy would do like a little moonwalk across the dance floor in his PJs, grab a water and this sounds awful, but like look for the drunkest girl and attempt to like make it happen in 15 minutes. Mikey, what were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> that that yeah. sounds like so more of you. Bro, that sounds story. more of your speed. Yeah, that's my Mikey story. I, no, bar and PJs. Oh, def more to PJ. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I work all the other stuff. Pants. Definitely more. Like, yo, th this is yeah. how I would go to work. Honestly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is how you go to work. Yeah, this is <laughs> that is, that's exactly what you wear. That is your uniform. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the bottom feeders were always funny to me because it was like a little show. I like that. That's funny. That could be a show, dude. Like the bottom, bottom feeders, feeders. The bottom. The people who live like on top of above a bar. bar and all the things they do, or so like buy, here first. So buy that domain. Insert yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Please do. Or like one guy lived above the bar and he begged for two years, right? He's like, I'm a DJ. Like, let me DJ. And he was clearly a crackhead. Like, he was not a DJ. And so he would come in and like beg every day. So the owner was like, no, you're never going to f***. No, no. So he came in one night and he's like, look, I really want a DJ. And we're like, oh, weird thing is our DJ canceled. Like, you're up, dude. You're in. And he's like, yes. And he ended up being an actual like really talented DJ. He did it with vinyls. So next thing I know, here he comes with like a cigar hanging out of his mouth, a little newsboy cap, and yes. he's rolling in crate after crate after crate of records. And I'm like, are you f***ing serious? It's a Saturday night. It's the only bar in town that people like would come to to dance. And this is what, but he did a really good job. So I was being judgmental. Yo, DJs who on vinyl, I was that's, being the judgmental. Best, that's the best kind of f***ing Oh, when you see that, you're like, you see, you're like high, oh, you bro. know what you're doing. Yeah. You got but the we were boy printing cap. and then he proved us Looking wrong. Like some LL Cool J shit? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're yeah. He proved us wrong. I was yeah. judgmental. I'm like, here we go. This is going to be great. Amazing. Yeah. And they kept bringing him back. So he got a job. Whoever your name is, find us. What is his name? It was a weird one. I don't remember. He's probably so still cool. there. I don't think people ever leave from upstairs. <sighs> so it might have been. Uh, my, Todd, I was at you. <laughs> DJ, he was. Uh, last getting you out of here. Out of all these crazy things, what's the thing that you appreciate the most that kind of keeps you going through all, all the wild shit? The people, One thing. Okay. the people I that, work that, with. That's the theme. Yeah, like, yeah. We love it. Yeah. That become my friends. I mean, all my friends from high school are not my friends anymore. I think I have two people that I touch base once a year with. Every single person in my life, including my husband, is somebody I met either working at a bar or working at a bar. I mean, I, I talk to you probably more than your, me and Chris probably talk to you more than your husband does. On a well, daily yeah, because you guys want to talk to me for sure. <laughs> <laughs> He's heard it all. He already knows half the it comes to my mouth. He's like, seriously. So yeah, he's done listening. So that doesn't really mean we talk a lot. It just means you're actually talking to me. He's on autopilot now. <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, she's home again. But he does say, he's like, when you're gone and you come home, it throws it off because I'm the, 
I, I mix things up a little bit because he's in his you're system. The spark, you're the fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm the fun one. I'm the fun parent. I enjoy having her on the road with me. <laughs> I've had a great it, time. It, it's yeah. it's 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 just like I said. I talk to her at least two to three times a day, and then when we're on when we're traveling, I'm literally with her from nine o'clock in the morning when we're all like, all right, cool. It's like everyone meet downstairs at nine a.m. I'll be with her from 9 a.m. to like f-ing 4 in the morning, but we work very, very close together. Well, we do wellness checks on each other. Yeah. So we'll just text each other after and go wellness check. And I'm yes. like, it's going bad or it's going good or actually not as bad as I thought. Like I'm doing good right now. So that's only every once in a while. Most of the times we're like, fuck everybody. <laughs> yeah. I hate everybody yeah. except for you right now. <laughs> it they all, all started suck. when I was 11 and here I am yeah. working in this industry. And what did I do with my life? Uh, <laughs> yeah. we'll, get like, we'll get like texts from people and then we'll, we'll, we'll like in group chats and we'll side text each other like, why are they bothered? What is wrong, buddy? You all. No, we love our team, though. Yeah, (laughs) we do it. But (laughs) oh man, Lindsay, we appreciate you being on. It was awesome. You're so funny. I really do appreciate you so so much. Great time. Lots of fun little gems in there. Yay! I had a great time. Yes. And I'm glad you did. Yay! Thank you for having me. Yay! Yo, that was the chaos. We'll see you next time. Peace.